Amen. Amen. Before I read this scripture, John, gospel according to John chapter 15, looking at verses 12 through 17. Amen. Amen. Look who walked in the room. Amen. Amen. Can't just be walking in. Amen. Amen. Good to see you. Praise the Lord. Apparently, I'm not the only one shocked to see you. Um, <laughs> the gospel according to John chapter 15, verses 12 through 17. Uh, as you're finding that, uh, I did fail to uh, just remind us that uh, Minister Ben and his lovely wife, Sister Elizabeth Benjamin, are leading us in prayer each Thursday night this month, starting at 7, from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. We still have two more Thursdays in the month. Uh, March 22nd and March 29th. So 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, and these are two praying folks. So, hey amen. I think about them on Thursdays and I'm so glad that they are uh, warm in our sanctuaries with those petitions and that thanksgiving to God. So they want you to join them. Uh, so, amen. Again, remaining two Thursday nights uh, at 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. and then Lord willing in April We'll just segue right into Bible study on those nights at those times. Amen? Amen. So let's remain prayerful and, and participate and support. John 15, starting at verse 12, the gospel according to John, chapter 15, beginning at verse 12. This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. <coughs> Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servants knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Verse 17, these things I command you, these things I command you, that ye love one another. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his holy inspired word. Amen. Father, we thank you for grace, amazing grace, and for your power and your presence in this place today. We pray that all who are within the hearing of the succeeding words would be blessed by the movement of your spirit to bring understanding, to bring direction, God. Help us as we strive to do your will. In Christ's name, we ask that. Amen. Amen. Thank you, ushers, for your reverence to God's word. Amen. Good to see all of you in God's house today. Today's thought is God's love is thicker than man's blood. God's love is thicker than man's blood. The theme for today's message is really about friendship. Amen? It's really about friendship. Ultimately, the friendship between the followers of Christ and himself. And how Jesus Christ becomes the ultimate model of what it means to be a friend. Amen. What it means to be a friend. There are so many trivial and, frankly, silly things that separate, separate us. Um, and preparing for this message, I was reading C.H. Uh, Spurgeon. And when I was reading him, there was a story that he tells about two sisters. And this would have been in the late 1800s. So the, the story will sound a little dated for that reason. But there were two sisters who lived in what he called a flat, which was basically an apartment. Two sisters who lived in an apartment. And um, they had been loving and close growing up. But at some point, they had a spat about something or other. And they never recovered from that argument. They would live the rest of their lives divided. And it became so bad that at some point, one of them took a piece of chalk and drew a line down the middle of the apartment. The line started at the middle of the fireplace so that both could cook, but they could only use their side of the fireplace. And they drew it all the way to the front door, and they would each have to go out 
the flat or the apartment from their side of the door. Um, and they lived the rest of their lives that way. Ha having gone decades as friends, uh, one falling out destroyed all of that. And unfortunately, if not true of ourselves, I think most of us, if you're of some age, can look around you and see situations where people have allowed, have allowed their relationships to devolve to the point where they don't even speak to one another. We also can look around ourselves and see situations where relationships that should be natural and strong and healthy are not, namely those relationships with relatives. One would think that if you didn't have relationships with anybody else, you'd have relationships with your relatives, especially your close ones. That would be your siblings, your children, grandchildren, parents, grandparents. But we all know, we're all old enough in this place to know, at least most of us to know, that that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes the, the most violent, uh, the most difficult fractures happen in the family, right? I've talked to law enforcement, and I've been told that sometimes the worst calls to go to are spats between family, husbands and wives, and parents and children. Those get the most violent because we're, we were closest in those relationships. Those are the most intimate relationships that we have. Those are the, uh, presumably the folks who know the most about us. So it's no wonder that the Bible, in particular Jesus Christ, teaches us that the one thing that marks us as his followers, the one thing that is most true about all of us as disciples of Christ is the love that we show. Because let's be honest, there's a lot of stuff that can divide us. Our politics can divide us, and unfortunately often do, right? Economics can divide us, how much money we have or don't have. Levels of education can divide us. Some of us are too intelligent for others of us. But the one thing that unites us, the one thing that can keep us all walking in the same direction and keep us bonded is the love of God. The Bible says that, the, that God's love covers a multitude of sins. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But you know my favorite. You all know my favorite from Romans. God showed us his love and that while we were yet sinners. And that's the kind of love that we should adopt and adapt because that kind of love apparently overlooks the worst of us to see the potential for the best of us. That's a difficult kind of love, to look, to look past someone's worst and be able to see their best, right? And God loved us so much in that while we were at our worst, he was doing everything he could to get us to our best. Now that's a friend. Uh, also in studying for this, I read a quote, and I don't know who it was by, I think it was from an unknown person that says, that a friend is someone who uh, knows all about you and loves you anyway. Right? And isn't it great that you can be with people who know you and accept you for who you are and you don't have to pretend to be something other than God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet. He loved us while we were being us. He loved us anyway while we were being us. God loved us anyway while we were being us. And then as Christians, we talk about loving the way God loves, which means then we have to love people exactly where they are. How many of you finding yourself to having to consciously think to yourself, I got to love that person right where they are? Unfortunately, sometimes they're the people closest to us, right? Sometimes they're our children or our spouses or... The wise father in Proverbs talks a lot about friendship when he's instructing his son, teaching him how to be successful in the world. Not economically successful, but spiritually successful, morally successful. How, son, can you be successful in the world? One of the things he talks to him about is being friendly. In Proverbs 18, he says to his son, 
Um, Proverbs 18.24, he says, uh, those who have friends must show themselves friendly. Right. right? Now, you may not immediately recognize it, but it actually springs from a spiritual principle that we learn elsewhere. Right? Which is that you reap what you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow, right? If you sow friendliness, then you will reap friendliness. You will reap friendliness. So the behaviors that you espouse, the behaviors that you demonstrate are behaviors that return to you from others. If you reap being cantankerous, <laughs> It's because you probably sowed cantankery. I'm not sure that's a word, but I just made it one. Right? If you sow stubbornness, then don't be surprised when you reap stubbornness. There's a reason why our children are like us. Lord, help us today. <laughs> In all the ways, they tend to be like us, both the good and the bad. That's us reaping what we sow. I remember this comedy skit from um, Bill Cosby where he talks about talking to his children and he's just full of frustration because of all the stuff that they are bringing him through at the time. And he says to them, I just can't wait for you to have children. <laughs> Amen. All the parents in the room immediately got that joke. He didn't have to say anything else. Amen. That was the punchline right there. Can't wait for you to have children so you can experience all the stuff that I've experienced. That's called a parent's revenge. Grandchildren are a, parent, a parent's revenge. Right? Because you get to become familiar with everything that I as a parent had to go through with you. But it's true. The stuff that we sow, we reap. And sometimes you sit back and you go, you know what? I can't be mad at you because that's me. I've said it to my children. That's me. Yeah, that's me. Lord, help me today. Those who want friends, those who have friends, to maintain those relationships, you got to show yourself friendly. In a moment, I'm going to talk about Jesus and how he demonstrates this, but just as a practical matter, right? We have to give out what we want to receive back. That's what he tells his son. In Proverbs 17, 17, uh, he tells his friend that a friend loves at all times, Right? A friend loves at all times. We call them fair weather friends, those who are only with us when things are good, but in fact, they're not friends at all. If people are only around you because of how you can benefit them and they never actually have a genuine bond with you, they're not, not really friends. See, that's the thing about family. We're bound by blood. We almost feel duty bound to deal with one another, right? Right? Because if the truth be told, there are some people in your family that you deal with that you wouldn't deal with if they were not family. Amen. So there's sort of this natural bond with family that says, well, you, you my cousin or my nephew or my niece or my brother or my sister or my aunt or whatever you are. And so on that basis, I got to connect with you. But if it wasn't for that, mm, if that family reunion was just the barbecue in the park, I wouldn't be there. But it's a family reunion, so it's family. It got to be there, right? He tells his son, but really, true friendships, real friendships, genuine friendships, they exist through the thick and the thin, right? Through the cold and the hot, through the good and the bad. Friends are there. Friends are there at all times. I, I, would, I would submit to us today that instead of doing an inventory of our own lives, right? We go around just talking about people being friends. Oh, that's my friend. But if you do an inventory of your own life, how many friends do you have? <laughs> Not acquaintances. See, you don't just call yourself my friend. I, I, I catch myself sometimes. A lot of folks will slap, slap me on the back when they're in the presence of other people and say, oh, this is my friend. Yeah. Mm-mm. Because I don't know. Got to be careful who you get associated with. Not everybody in my friendship circle. 
There's a difference between a friend and an acquaintance. And if you take an inventory of your own life, you will realize you've got far fewer friends than you think. Everybody who shows up to celebrate your birthday ain't your friend. Everybody connect with you on Facebook ain't your friend. The wise father talks to his son and says, here's how you're going to know your friends. They with you all the time, dude. They with you all the time. Even when you embarrass them, they don't abandon you. Elsewhere in the Proverbs, that same father would tell his son that there is sweetness in the friend who gives you wise counsel. Friends can talk to you. They can talk at you. They can say, look, you were wrong. Now, I didn't tell you that in the midst of everybody else because I wasn't going to dress you down because you're my friend. But now that it's just you and I, I want you to understand that I saw what you did. I heard what you said, and you were wrong. Everybody else wasn't going to tell you nothing, but I'm going to tell you something. Why? Because I'm your friend, and I'm here all the time, dude. I'm here all the time. I see everything, and that was wrong. Friend will give you wise counsel because they're a friend all the time, not just during the good times or the high times, right? Another thing that the wise uh, father would say is found in Proverbs 27.10, and I'm going to ask you to turn there because I need this to be evidenced before I say it, that this isn't my opinion, this is scripture. Proverbs 27. When you find it, say, I have it. Amen. Somebody's quick out there. (laughs) <laughs> and she's not even using an iPad. Bless her heart. Proverbs twenty-seven ten says, thine own friend and thy father's friend, right? Talking about generational friendships. Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not. Don't abandon good friendships. Don't, don't abandon good friendships. Man, they're too hard to form. So when you get them, hold on to them. Don't let silly things separate you from the people who love you and who you love. Learn to get over the petty stuff. Don't make mountains out of molehills. Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not. Neither go into thy brother. Now, this part is the reason why I want you to lay your own eyes on it. It says, neither go into thy brother's house in the day of thy calamity. It said, neither. In other words, don't. Don't go into your brother's house in the day of thy calamity. For better is a neighbor that is near than a brother far off. I want you to understand the weight of what the father is saying to the son. Don't let artificial bonds cause you to miss the blessing of genuine ones. Do not reach out to those who you feel must help you out of duty. Reach out for those who love you out of a genuineness of a desire for fellowship and a sense of authentic intimacy. When you ignore the people who do love you, so that you can force other people to love you because you feel it's their duty, you're missing out. We can burn a lot of energy chasing folks who don't want us in their orbit. Or we can enjoy the blessing of those who do. What was it that uh, the late uh, Maya Angelou said? And I quote the whole quote. I've noticed most people only quote part of it. I'm going to quote the whole thing. And the whole thing is, when people show you who they are, believe them. But that wasn't the whole quote. The whole quote was, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. We have the power to stop people from hurting us repeatedly. By understanding what love looks like and then embracing it. Understand what love looks like, then embrace it. When I can't be with my brother by blood, it's okay to be with my brother by love. 
especially when it's God's love being demonstrated to me. Because God's love is stronger than man's blood. We've heard the saying, blood is thicker than water. Anybody ever hear that saying? Did you know that's not the whole quote? You want to hear the whole quote? Because I believe in whole quotes. The whole quote is, the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. The blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. Sometimes we try to force relationships that aren't natural. There's a reason why we don't get along with some people. Because how can two, the book of Amos, how can two walk together except they agree? And let's face it, sometimes you agree with those who the world says should be closest to you. Sometimes y'all just agree. Which is why the Bible says, the Bible says, that we shouldn't be unequally yoked together with Unbelievers. Jesus help me today. <laughs> I, re- I think I remember reading in the book of Matthew chapter 8 where Jesus says as he's calling disciples, as he says to one disciple who has agreed to follow him, but the man has an excuse. He says, I'll follow you, but you always got to be aware of them buts. I'll follow you, but I, just, I need to go bury my loved one right now. What did Jesus say to that person? Let the dead... Sometimes we have to understand the value of one relationship over another, and there are relationships in our lives that are more valuable than others. All people in our lives don't get the same level of priority. And if they do, we're doing life wrong. Learn to identify those relationships that are worthy of nurturing and those that you should abandon. In the words of that great love song, I can't make you love me if you don't. John 15 says, John 15 says, this is my commandment that ye love one another. But Jesus says it like this, as I have loved you. It is not some love that comes without definition or qualification or demonstration. Jesus says, I want you to have this extraordinary kind of love to one another. But I do want you to understand it's extraordinary and it looks like the way I love you. Now, that would not completely make sense to us until after Calvary. So it stands to reason that the disciples, when they heard that, could not understand the full weight of that, but we can because we have the gift of retrospection. We can look back and see how Jesus loved us. And it makes sense when he says, I want you to love each other the way that I have loved you. And what does that mean? That means that love is sacrificial at its, at its very heart. The kind of love that God wants us to demonstrate is at its very heart sacrificial. It surrenders. It gives up. It pays a price. It comes with a cost. Love one another the way that I have loved you. Then he talks about the greater love. And and love can have no greater expression. Love can never be any more clearly shown than when a man gives his life for another. Is this a call for us to kill one another for each other? No. That would be thinking like Nicodemus. No. It is to say that we should be able to make whatever sacrifice was necessary for the betterment of our brothers, for the salvation, for the redemption of our brothers. Does it mean, Pastor, that I should empty out my bank account and just give my money away to all my friends? No, it doesn't mean that, but if you're going to do that, I'm your friend. That's not what it means. What it means is that I, as your friend, I want nothing more for you than to be in the will of God. And if there's something I can do to help lead you to the will of God, to reconcile you with the Father, that's the thing I'll do. Please understand the nature of Christian friendships. 
Christian friendships always have an agenda, and that agenda is to see folks reconciled to God. And when I call you out, I'm not calling you out because I want to embarrass you. I'm not calling you out because I feel like I'm better than you. I'm calling you out because I see you going astray, and I need you to line up with God's will. Because I don't want to get to heaven and not see you there, friend. I don't want to get to heaven and not see you there. And you can't call yourself my friend and not want to hear about Jesus from me. That's the terms of friendship. Now, I can have a relationship with people that I don't have a friendship with. Jesus called the, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, he, he called them, they, he said that they were sepulchers filled with dead men's bones. He called them hypocrites. And yet he still went to the temple and read the scripture before them. He still participated in that service. Is that hypocrisy? No. That's the nature of friendship. He was extending himself to them. He was saying, Here, here's the definition of true relationship. That we should know one another in the will of God. We should know one another in the will of God. Folks often say, but pastor, you don't understand. Jesus hung out with prostitutes and publicans. So when I hang out with my worldly friends, it's okay because Jesus did it. Come on, you twist in the scripture. Because when he did it, he did it with an agenda. He ministered to them. They didn't go to the local IHOP and eat pancakes and... Talk about the housewives of Damascus. He opened himself and, and showed them the will of God and gave them an opportunity to be reconciled. And I got to tell you, there is no higher purpose on this planet than to be the one who is a light for God. Demonstrates the power of Christ. That's a true friend, a friend who wants you to be saved and redeemed. That's a true friend. Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Verse 14, really quickly, you are, I love these, these next couple of verses are perhaps among the favorite verses have, they've become to me in the Bible. They seem to be the most intimate words of Christ that recorded in all the scripture. And they bear great weight with me. I hope they do for you. For he says in verse 14, you are my friend. He's talking to me right now. He's talking to me right now. He's saying, you are my friend, Carnell. You are my friend. Listen, here are the terms of the relationship. Every relationship has terms, folks. Here are the terms. You are my friend. Here's the if, the divine if, if you do whatsoever I command you. Paul would teach that we should not have casual fellowship with the world. Because light doesn't have fellowship with darkness. Jesus says, here are the terms of the relationship. If, if you are doing what I command you, then we can have that friendship. I'm not saying we can't have relationships outside of the context of the organic church. What I'm saying is they can never be close, intimate relationships because light does not have fellowship with darkness. And a preacher once taught me, and I've believed it since I heard it, one of two things will happen in your environment. Either it will change you or you will change it. I heard that and I believe it. Either your environment will change you or you will change it. And if you're hanging around certain people, there's also a scripture that tells us that when you've got these bad relationships, these dark relationships, they corrupt communication. They promote in you a bad lifestyle. Amen. Amen. Eating brunch on Sunday over mojitos. <laughs> Three of y'all understand what I'm talking about. Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> hmm. He says, you are my friends if you do. Those are the terms. If you do what I command you, verse 15, henceforth I call you not servants. Thank you, Jesus. Because the servant must serve blind, must serve blind as to what the inspirations and motivations are. A servant knoweth not 
what his Lord doeth. He cannot know the mind and the heart of the one who commands him. That's, that's the relationship of a servant. To do what he or she is told without any justification, whether or not you agree, just do what you're told. That is not the relationship we have with Jesus Christ. Here's the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. He says, I call you friends for all things that I have heard of my father, I have made known to you. When you are in intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, he not only guides you as to what to do, but he gives you a why. For all the people over the ages of the church who says you should never question God, just do what you're told. That is not the nature of the relationship. I have a right in prayer to ask God, why am I going this way, Father? And to expect that he will at some point answer me. While he may not always come when I call him, he's good God from Zion. He's always on time. And that's an enemy of relationship when I can talk to my father by the authority that I have in Jesus Christ. And not only does he tell me what to do in life, but he explains to me the intricacy of, of his design and his plan. And I get to see that God's doing something with me. He's doing something through me. He's doing something for me. God is doing something. Sometimes he, he presents it all at once. Sometimes it unfolds slowly. But always in the end, I can look back and see that God had a plan. That's God showing me. I'm excited. Just let me calm down for a minute. Verse 16. I love what Jesus says about friends. He says, you didn't choose me. I don't owe you anything. It's, you know, you didn't just wake up one day and go, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. Here's the great mystery. He says, I have chosen you. You know what amazes me? That God knew me before I was formed in my mother's belly. My mother's sitting right over here. He knew me before I was formed in that belly. What an amazing thing. Not only did he know me, but he had plans for me. Plans to prosper me and not to, to harm me. Jesus looks at me, Carnell is a friend, and he says, you know what? I chose you. And I got to say to you, man, it feels good to be chosen. Amen. For all the times I wasn't chosen for the kickball team or the touch football team or the pickup basketball team, for all those times I was rejected by others, it sure feels good to be chosen. I was rejected by that girl my, aunt, my mother tried to set me up with. It sure feels good to be chosen. It feels so good to know that somebody wants me. Somebody wants me. It's true. There's somebody for everybody. His name is Jesus. <laughs> I have chosen you. You haven't chosen me. And I've ordained you. I've ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. That, that divine selection through Jesus Christ, not only puts me in a position where I feel his affection and his desire, but his choice of me empowers me. I am empowered to do the will of God because Christ has chosen me. In fact, Christ has chosen all of mankind. Many are called, few are chosen, it says. But in the context of that verse, it's because few answer the call. Those who answer the call they become the choice. Amen. Amen. And that your fruit should remain and that whatsoever you shall ask of the father in my name, what shall, whatsoever you shall ask of the father in my name, he may give it you. Oh, man, I'm going to start asking right now. <laughs> you have not because you. And even when you get around to asking. Amen. You're only looking to consume it upon your lust. But when you ask with a right and a ready heart, when you're in true relationship with Jesus Christ, what does true relationship mean? You're chasing him, seeking him, 
looking for him, discerning his presence, acknowledging his presence in your life. When you have that kind of intimate relationship, then you can go before him and ask anything that you will, and it will be given you. Now, some folks get scared, but what if I ask for something crazy? Well, if you're chasing him and in relationship with him, you're probably not going to ask for something crazy. There is a conversion of mind. You think a different way when you are truly chasing Jesus. This is not some artificial religious relationship that is brought about through legacy and tradition and history. No, this is a living, thriving, organic, intimate relationship you have with Christ that you nurture every day in prayer and in study and in seeking. And it gets stronger day after day and year after year. And his voice gets clearer in you. Hmm. I'm excited again, so I'm going to call it down. <laughs> Verse 17, he says, these things I command you that you love. Listen. That you love one another. Christ says, look at the way I did it. I went out. I was led of my father to choose 12. And I chose them. And I nurtured them. And I kept them. I want you to hear me real good right now. God wants us to nurture relationships in our lives that keep us strong in him. Which means relationships that don't do that are not your responsibility. Those folks that we are chasing, trying to get them to love us, trying to get them to accept us, trying to get them to acknowledge us. It's wasted energy. It's wasted time. There are folks that God has put around us that he wants us to connect with. And just the way he's preparing our hearts for them, he's preparing their hearts for us. And ultimately, when you have a good relationship, a good friendship in particular, there is mutual sacrifice. There's mutual sacrifice between me and Jesus. It's not equal sacrifice. It is not equal, but it is mutual. Because in scripture, I am told to present to him my body. Present to him my body as a living sacrifice. That's my sacrifice. Jesus made a sacrifice for me. 2,000 years ago, when he allowed them to nail him to the cross, he was making a sacrifice for me. And as I often think about it, they nailed him in his hands for the evil stuff that I had touched. They nailed him in his feet for the evil places that I had gone. They pierced him in his side for the evil appetites that I had. Put a crown of thorns and pressed it into his scalp for the evil thoughts that I had formed. He did that for me. For God so loved the world that he swaddled himself in flesh for me. Abased himself, condescended himself to human form for over 30 years for me, allowed them to beat him all night long for me, allowed them to stretch him out on the cross for me, hung his head and died for me, allowed himself to be buried in a bald tomb for me. And then three days later, early one morning, Jesus got up for who? For me, I don't need you to convince me. God loves me. God loves me. Now it becomes my responsibility to show that love to others around me. Let's stand. The love of God is thicker than the blood of men. Family ties bind us together, restrict us, make us feel like we have to do things. The love of God bonds us together. We are yoked together, we are linked together because we desire to be. Every head bow, every eye closed. I want to cultivate and nurture those relationships wherein the love of God has bonded us together. I want them to develop to be those godly friendships 
where I can increase another and they can increase me. And ultimately, I want our fellowship, our fellowship to be a demonstration of Christ's love for the church, of God's love for the world. Ultimately, that's what happens. We are, we are lights. Our human relationships become lights to a lost and dying world who needs to see healthy relationships. The world does not see that today. They need to see healthy relationships and understand that that's a benefit of surrendering to God. It's our responsibility to show them those healthy relationships. Father, I thank you today for your wonderful grace toward me, your great love for me and that you sent your son to die for me. I thank you, Jesus, for laying down your life for me. Father, you know what relationships exist in my and our lives. You know which ones are destructive, counterproductive. You know which ones are strengthening, beneficial, and advantageous. You know which ones are born in darkness and which ones are born in light. Father, I pray you will continue to lead us toward the light. Help us to nurture strong and healthy relationships. Help us to loose counterproductive relationships. Show us who our true friends are. Show us who your true friends are so that we can make them our friends. Father, give us sight, give us insight. In the name of Jesus, help us. Be wisdom for us. Be wisdom for us. I pray in the name of Jesus. If you are under the sound of my voice and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, come now. Come this day. Give your life to Jesus. Know him as your friend. Is there one? Is there one? We have done as we have been commanded, and yet there's room. You may take your seats.